You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Heiser's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 191, SBL Conference Interviews, part two. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland. He's a scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike. Still here. We are still here in Boston. <laughs> Boston. Bo- I can't even say that. Boston. Ba- Boston. I can't even do it. <laughs> I'm from West That's, Texas. I know, we it's can't. A real we, challenge. These Yankees. <laughs> I don't understand it. <laughs> uh, we yeah. We, we we should talk about some of the the Lyft drivers. You know, we've had really thick accidents. Oh yeah, we had one that uh, he was straight out of Boston, yeah, South Boston. So yeah, it was really really pronounced. Yeah. Well, anyway, we have our our second round of, of interviews. We have two uh, in this part. Part two, uh, we have Ben Jaffone, and uh, Ben is a podcast listener. He's familiar with the Naked Bible podcast, really enjoys it, as does his mother. Uh, the uh, what, What's really interesting, what, what appealed to me about having him on the show is his teaching context. He teaches in Lithuania, and believe it or not, um, Unseen Realm is known in Lithuania, as is the podcast. So an interesting interview with him. And then we talked to John Schwant. John is the director of mobile education, mobile ed at Logos, just about what mobile ed is, why it's important, and why the listeners uh, of this podcast would really, really benefit from, you know, that particular program, uh, the courses that we have. We have over 200 courses uh, that people can take right there in your own home and really learn biblical content so that... Mobile Ed's kind of in the wheelhouse for us. You know, our, our aim, as always, is to try to get good content to anybody who's interested. So another good set of interviews. Back at SBL again, and we have with us, uh, correct me if I mispronounce your last name, but Ben Giffone? Giffone. Giffone. It's like okay. giraffe. Like giraffe. All right. <laughs> well, um, Ben is a uh, is a scholar that uh, discovered the podcast and then uh, Unseen Realm, but he has a really interesting... Uh, story, or at least a uh, you know backdrop to this. So I'm going to ask him to introduce himself uh, and how he again found the podcast, where he went to school, and what he's doing. Hmm. Well, yeah, thanks for thanks for having me on the podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, usually, I go by Benj just okay. for the for, for the, the record G. there, so that people know. <laughs> because I, when I went to uh, university, I went to Cairn University. There were five other uh, Bens in my <laughs> dorm, and so growing up, I had gone by Ben or Benj, but figured at that point, uh, mononymity was something to aspire to. But yeah. I did my undergraduate work at Cairn University, formerly Philadelphia Biblical University. And that was where I really got interested in biblical studies and um, original languages. I grown up in a Christian home, but did not really um, thought I knew the Bible well, but I really didn't realize I didn't. So I wanted to go to seminary and go to graduate school and uh, just keep on taking this wherever it would take me. So I did my uh, seminary work. I did a year at Westminster Seminary, got out in the middle of a bit of a controversy there. And oh, were you then there with, with, was that Pete? That was with Pete. Yeah. Okay. So right. I was there at when he was suspended. Um, Pete ends. Uh, oh, that's interesting. So it was, we'll, we'll try not to drill down on that. But yeah. Yeah. Really that's a story for Pete to tell <laughs> yeah. uh, if he's permitted by contract or by agreement, whatever. Um, but um, so then I went back to Cairn actually and finished my uh, two year seminary degree there and then did uh, a master of theology and PhD at Stellenbosch University in Western Cape, South Africa. Was that all by distance? Or yeah, you... yeah. The the master's program was three uh, three oral exams on reading lists and a thesis. Okay. And so I went to South Africa a couple of times. And was it biblical those... studies? Right. Okay. Yes, I did um, Old Testament. So mm-hmm. Lamentations was my master's thesis, and then I did my dissertation on Chronicles. Okay. Was Christo your advisor or somebody else? No, I did my my uh, bo- both projects were supervised by uh, Louis Yonker, who okay. teaches in the Faculty of Theology. I think Christo is in the Ancient uh, Studies Department. Okay. So. Uh, this is interesting because you know, I often have people ask about, hey, you know, I want to go to seminary or I'm thinking about doctoral work. And, you know, the Stellenbosch, again, I know several people who've gone through the, the programs there. And it's it's inexpensive because of the RAND, 
Um, get, just give people an idea of what you would pay for a year. Well, for the MTH tuition, when I went there, it was it was the equivalent of four thousand dollars. If the tuition has stayed the same in the rand, that's going to be even less in dollars mm-hmm. or euros right now. And so that's the whole program. That was the whole program. Now I had to travel there a couple sure. times, and the travel is actually, you know, it's the round trip is depending on what time of year you go, maybe twelve hundred dollars. But once you're there, staying there is fairly cheap. So yeah. I, in in short, in three years, I did two degrees, and I, the the PhD tuition is cheaper. And I went to South Africa, I think a total of four times, once with my wife, and that was for a vacation in uh-huh. a defense. And I think I spent less than $10,000 the mm, whole thing for, ev- wow. for everything. Wow, two trips degrees and four trips. And a vacation. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that's, that's a dramatic cost reduction. <laughs> yeah, much cheaper than paying for an American program, which you should never do, I think, yeah. unless you're independently yeah, wealthy. No, really, yeah. No, it's, there's a lot to be said for that. You had a good experience, I take? I did. You know, I don't think that necessarily that model would be for everyone. I had, you know, very supportive advisor. I had access in the United States when I was doing my research to good theological libraries close by. And I had already done Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, and some German Mm -hmm. by the time I was got, got to the program. So it, it wouldn't work for everyone necessarily, but it worked for me and got me to the point where I yeah. could teach. Did, did you have a, a clear uh, thesis and or dissertation topic before you enrolled? Because uh, some of those, you know, the, the, the so-called European model, you, know, you, you pretty much have to have your research topic pretty well thought through to present it and then get it approved and then go to, you know, do your research on it. Did, is that w- what you experienced? Yeah, that's that's the way it worked. I mean, when I applied, I originally applied for the doctoral program. And actually, Louis worked with me for several months before I was even enrolled as a student on refining my proposal, which was part of my application. And basically, the faculty reviews your proposal. And then if they like it, you're accepted. Um, and so that was that was the application process. Now, they accepted me because I had not done a research-based master's in the States, they considered my seminary degree to be like a second bachelor's. Okay. So that's why they admitted me into the MTH degree first. And then upon successful completion of the thesis, mm-hmm. then they, I had to apply again for a PhD. Okay. And I, at that time I was sick, a little bit sick of lamentations. And so <laughs> I, I thought of something else to do, stayed in the Persian period, but um, wanted to do more in the area of chronicles. So. Wow. Well, hopefully, you know, somebody out there listening again, because I get the question a lot. Uh, hopefully you, you're listening now and you heard that. That might be a good possibility, mm-hmm. uh, both in terms of expense, if you have a clear sense of direction in terms of research. Yeah, look into Stellenbosch. Um, yeah, I would say so. Or even there are other other universities in South Africa that are uh, internationally known. I think it really just depends on the advisor that you have and sure. what topic you want to study. If you can find an advisor who is well-known in the field and is publishing and is willing to work with you, then um, I think it can be, could be a great fit. And I'm always happy to put in a plug for South Africa as a great place to go uh, with um, wonderful scenery. And oh, sure. uh, if you're into uh, wine or international cuisine, Cape Town, which is right outside or right near Stellenbosch, is uh, a great town for those things. So just a great place mm-hmm. to visit. Okay, I have to ask you, did you do the great white shark thing where you go out in the boat and watch them throw seals around? <laughs> you know, I did. I actually did I did cage diving with great whites. It was a dream oh of mine. I did it two days before I defended my doctoral dissertation. <laughs> so this was in January. It's So January is the height of summer yeah. for them. And it's not the time of year when the, the, the great whites around Seal Island jump out of the water, but they mm-hmm. still are present and they hunt. Right. And so... I'd always wanted to do this, and uh, it was fairly re- reasonably priced, so I decided to do it. And my greatest fear was that something would happen, and <laughs> it'd be, you know, here lies part of Benjamin right. Chiffon, A- ABD, ABD forever, ABD. Yeah. That was that was the. <laughs> oh well, after after that adrenaline rush, I'm sure your your defense was pretty tame. Yeah, well, it was just a breeze compared to that. <laughs> All right. So where, where are you teaching? Because you're, you're, you're teaching at an interesting place, something uh, a little bit off the beaten path, uh, again, for a uh, different route than most uh, you know, new graduates would 
you know, wind up taking. So tell us about that. Well, one of the things that my wife and I had agreed on when we first set out in doctoral studies was that first, we weren't going to, into any debt to do it. And second, that because there were so few uh, positions available in North America for PhDs, we had to be prepared for the possibility of either um, doing pastoral ministry in North America, mm -hmm. which would have been fine, um, and still not going to rule that out in the future, um, or going overseas to teach. And that was something that we had, so we've talked about it ever since we were even engaged, I was going overseas. And after, as I was finishing my doctoral work, the opportunity presented itself to teach at a very interesting school called LCC International University. It's in Klaipeda, Lithuania, so right on the Baltic coast. And uh, LCC is a Christian, private Christian liberal arts university. So it's not a Bible college, it's not a seminary, but um, faculty are Christian and uh, staffed by many people who are uh, Christians, maybe half or a third from North America. Um, maybe that's a higher percentage. Uh, maybe it's a higher percentage than that. But but many of the students who come to LCC are not not Christians, would not say they're Christians, or would have grown up in a nominally Catholic or Orthodox um, household in Lithuania, Russia, Ukraine, um, Latvia, Belarus, any number of Central Asian uh, republics. So we have we have uh, Muslim students as well, but they're all required to take uh, a core of Bible and theology courses. And so, in addition, that's that's part of the mission of the school is to have, you know, these students from a variety of backgrounds in a Christian environment, and they go to study business and English language and other things like that. Then there's also a theology program. Um, and that's much smaller for, you know, understandable reasons in that part of the world, but um, the students that major or minor in theology, and that's primarily the courses that I teach is the upper level Old Testament courses for students that are majoring or minoring in uh, in theology. Now, when, when you get students in that particular program, it, what's the uh, end goal for them? Is it ministry? Is it you know, being a minister, being a pastor, whatever the terminology is over there. You know, it varies because a lot of the, it, it, even though the school is, um, is broadly Christ, is broad Christian uh, in that we have Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant who teach there, the theology faculty is specifically a faculty in evangelical or Protestant theology. And in terms of the Protestant churches in the, this part of the world, there are very few churches that could afford to pay a pastor. And so most pastors are bivocational. Okay. Um, most pastors are uh, male. There aren't that many female pastors. And so students that major or minor in theology um, are often looking towards either bivocational ministry or simply just having a, a better basis in their faith, especially those that do double degrees with something like English language. Sure. Or, business. Um, so it's also for personal enrichment. We don't have as many folks who are explicitly going down a pastoral track. Mm -hmm. well, how about access to Christian resources, you know, books related in some way to theology or biblical studies? Is there a lot of it? Is it very little? I mean, you know, give us it, a, a description of that. That's a, a struggle for a school as small as ours. We have in, in a way in in a way, it's better than it probably could be or or should be. Um, but we also we always struggle to find resources. We don't have um, we have limited access to the kinds of online databases and sure. e books that students and faculty at American institutions would just take for granted. Um, we are you know we're kind of dependent on donations for. Um, well, for much of what we do and including resourcing the library. So we get some of a library budget, but one of the ways we do this is to try to, instead of investing in textbooks or, you know, spending the resources that way, we try to use our department resources to beef up the library every chance we get. But it is not really a place where you can do academic research uh, of a high quality without somehow getting access uh, to 
journals and books some other way. So I'm very fortunate in that when I go back to the States for, from time to time, my home base is in Pennsylvania, which is near quite a few sure. libraries. Is is the issue finances or is it language? Is there a language barrier? You know, there just aren't many books in, again, you know, whatever language that would be a first um, language. It's it's mostly a, uh, an issue of resources because our students are all proficient in English okay. before they come. And actually, many of them speak three languages, so at, at least three. So the Lithuanian students will probably will speak English and usually some Russian and also English. Um and many of them also speak German as well. So they're they're even better equipped to do research sure. than than we are, yeah. you know, as the as monoglot Americans who had to struggle through, mm-hmm. you know, uh German or French, you know, for graduate yeah. reading. So, so but it's really a resourcing uh, issue, not as much a language issue. Hmm. What what are just give us an idea of one one or two specific courses? Uh, you teach. And then also we want to say something about, um, you mentioned Unseen Realm mm. in the uh, email that you, or email reply that you gave me. Um, so let, let's talk a little bit about some of the specifics that you teach and then exposing students to some of that content. Mm, yeah, sure. Um, so because I'm the Old Testament guy, <laughs> <laughs> I am the one who teaches the upper level courses. And so I teach them all, in a sense, all the canon courses on a rotation, um, Pentateuch, narrative books, mm-hmm. uh, the, wisdom literature. The whole canon issue and, would be interesting, you know, given, oh, yeah. given who's in the class. Yes, that's definitely something we address up front. And I can tell you just a brief story that kind of got me down that track was that, or, you know, studying this more uh, uh, intently was... I was in Pentateuch class and we were talking about the vow of the Nazir in um, in the book of Numbers, the Na- sometimes called the Nazarite vow. And I asked, you know, we were exploring how it's not generally supposed to be a permanent lifelong vow. It's time bound. And I asked the students, what, uh, what is the, um, who's the only person in scripture who was a Nazir from birth? And one of my Moldovan students who reads a Russian Bible primarily, raised his hand and said, Samuel. And that's because I, I remembered back to when I had studied Samuel, Septuagint and MT, it's that uh, in the Masoretic text, when Hannah gives her vow, uh, or, or, or a vows to the Lord that her son would be, de- if, she, if he gave, gave her a son, he would be devoted to the Lord. It says that a razor would never touch his head but the Septuagint says a razor will never touch his head and he will not drink wine or strong drink. Right. You get the rest of the vow there. Right. So it kind of completes the picture. Um, Whereas I was thinking of Samson. So that the fact that we have um, Lithuanian students using a Catholic Bible that includes the, uh, the Apocrypha and we have uh, students who work with the Bible in Russian language that includes also Apocrypha, but is even based on Church Slavonic, which is kind of a mix, uh, has a mixed textual basis with Septuagint and um, and Hebrew, that we, we do always have to have that discussion in class of, well, why do our, why do our, our Bibles yeah, not Yeah, why aren't the they the same? Yeah. Right. So that's, uh, it's, it's a great point of, um, you know, it's a great point to talk about history and some of the issues involved, but think the other the, uh, yeah the unseen realm content. unseen realm yes so unseen realm stuff i i was exposed first exposed to unseen realm or to to your work mike i want to say two years ago quite it, it was after you were well into naked bible podcast mm-hmm. and so i went back and listened to some key episodes and found your stuff and um uh shout out to my mom who's a big fan as well i think she was the one who introduced uh, me to uh, obviously to a woman of intelligence she so. is uh, <laughs> great intelligence and uh noble character as well um and so i found I mean, that you were making sense of so many of the passages that that either that in the evangelical world that i had grown up with they had just been kind of glossed over or in the w- wider world of biblical scholarship that they were just accepted as evidence of a certain um, developmental approach or as a certain development of Israelite religion that is based on, in my opinion, some questionable premises about what religion is and what revealed truth is. And so when I get to these passages in my, 
in my class when we talk about um, Genesis six and when we talk about um, in the in the wisdom literature, especially the book of Job and exploring who the the Satan is, the adversary in Job, I found that that paradigm and um, some of the excerpts that I gave to students, at least th- when I explained it to them using your uh, mm-hmm. your ideas, it made it made sense to them. Now I'm not sure, as I mentioned in my email, I'm not yeah. sure they had ever read the text closely enough to be troubled by right. <laughs> these things in a way yeah. that I had been. Um, but, uh, but it was interesting then to see how they play this out in their own thinking. Cause some of them, they come from such a wide array of backgrounds, but some of them who come from more uh, charismatic backgrounds in, especially in Ukraine, um, which has a very interesting, very robust uh, set of evangelical communities that I'm just beginning to, to learn about. I'll be actually teaching a course there next semester, just a compressed course at a small seminary there. But, but so those students that are more attuned to maybe the spiritual realm and hungering for something more spiritual amidst the kind of the darkness and the, say, the deadness of, um, you know, in the Soviet and post-Soviet kind of world, there's a real hunger to, to know about the spiritual um, and yeah. so I think well, that's something I sense in a lot of my students as well. You probably have heard uh, somewhere on the podcast uh, about the Supernatural you know, Translation Project. Mm. You know, I have translation rights to the little book, you know, Supernatural. That's the light version uh, of Unseen Realm. And we're, that's, being, that's being translated into 20 languages. Uh, Russian is done. Yeah. So I could give you links to this because they're all going to be free. My, oh, that would be my nonprofit is, is funding this. Uh, Russian is done. Ukrainian is still in process. We have a Czech translation going. Mm. Um, someone actually just emailed me recently to do Polish. Oh. Um, so we have some of the Eastern European languages. We have Arabic as well. That's, so, have you had a ha, have people? So you said people. Someone reached someone reached out to you about yeah, doing yeah. these. Uh, have you sensed that there's a, a particular hunger? for that kind of thing there, or there seems just, to be yeah okay. there, there seems to be the world. It, it surprised me I, I thought when we sort of launched this the initial idea was i wanted to get the book uh, supernatural translated into russian and arabic and chinese and, and all three of those are actually done now mm. but the idea was again these are places where you know you, you're going to have a church perhaps in an underground situation or really limited in resources mm. um and so I thought, well, th- those would be three. Those are the three I'm shooting for. And they actually happen really quickly. Hmm. I mean, almost, you know, a, maybe a week or two after we announced this, there were people in those three languages that stepped up. And they've all, uh, Chinese is still in the process of being vetted. And also, um, I, I can't remember what the dialect issue is in Chinese, but the people who are, are vetting the one translation are putting it into, uh, I think it was done in Mandarin, they're putting it into another uh, desirable, yeah, something. I can't remember which one it is, but again, they offered to do that. Uh, The Russian uh, translation was was done by a Russian national who's actually a pastor in Egypt, Hmm. which is really kind of, you know, know, off the beaten path. But then I I know another native Russian speaker who, you know, vetted the translation afterwards. And the same thing with Arabic. You know, they, they just, these people just sort of come out of the woodwork. Yeah. And several of them are like, they do this for a living. You know, they put, they take, uh, you know, English works, they they might be working freelance or for a publisher. And so this became a side project for Mm -hmm. them. Uh, So the response has been really, I think, both startling and gratifying Mm -hmm. at the same time. So anyway, they're they're for free. Uh, I'll send you the links, you know, to what's done. And and as other things get done, you know, you'll they'll be put in the same folder. So you'll have access to all of them. Just, you can pick what you want, pick yeah. what's helpful. Yeah. Russian is uh, quite an important, you know, say lingua franca uh, mm-hmm. in at LCC. You're just as likely to hear Russian in the dorms as you are mm-hmm. English because of all the post-Soviet influence. I think one of the things that I found most interesting about the, the work on unseen realm and the um, divine council that worldview has been that just that that uh, that you're trying to give people take the old testament 
seriously on its own. And I, mm-hmm. right now I have a, um, a thesis student who is um, very sharp and he's doing his, he's, he's German. He's doing his thesis on, uh, inspired by our wisdom lit class that we'd done a couple of years ago mm-hmm. on the presentation of Satan or the Satan in scripture and the problem of evil. And surprisingly, very little has been done on the specific relationship of the Satan to the problem of evil. At least that's what he and I mm-hmm. have found. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's remarkable how the, the, you know, when you start to get into the contrast between the Old and the New Testament, I think so many people are just, Christians are just trained to kind of read the New Testament back into the Old Testament without much regard for the original context of the Old Testament. And so... Um, and, and yet there is also a need, I would say, from, from a Christian perspective to sure. read the Old Testament, not just on its own terms first, that's important, but also in light of the New Testament. And so mm-hmm. that's something that really resonated with me. And I think, uh, a lot of my students as well that are discovering the Old Testament for the first time, um, on its own terms, that, that kind of way of thinking is, is quite, quite attractive and quite freeing as well because then you can look at the old testament and, and not feel like we have to shoehorn it into right. a particular um theological system or a confessional commitment beyond the commitment that mm-hmm. well this this points us to christ and now it's our job to figure out how yeah yeah I, well i have found that it, to me it seems the more that you, you take the old testament in light of its own context that will again open your eyes to new ways of thinking about any number of passages. And, and some of those new ways, in fact, a lot of them actually do have hooks into the new Testament where mm. you, you wouldn't have seen that either. Mm. So it, to, to me, it, it doesn't distance the old Testament uh, from the new. I think it closes the gap a little bit, you know, in, in, in mm. several respects. So it's not, it's not a non, it, it's not a Christocentric way of looking at things, but it's not like it's cutting off Christology and, and these other things. It it just presents different ways to uh, different threads that will carry through. Uh, and again, maybe maybe taking some connection point and and readjusting it in a certain way, but the connection point's still there. Hmm. Uh, it's just you know we have to think about it a little bit differently. So I know sometimes it it really freaks people out to to do what I'm asking them to do mm. because they're so used to having this way of thinking between the Testaments mm. kind of solidified or they're, they're just, they're cemented in one way of doing that. And then it, it feels to them like you're trying to break it mm. yeah. when that just isn't the case. Can I ask you a critical scholarship sure. uh, question or from, from that standpoint, talk shop for a second. Um, so one of the things I'm working on right now where I'm still, still wrestling through this is, First Kings 18, the Elijah's confrontation with the prophets of Baal, there's a lot of discussion about, the way I got into this question was asking, why was it okay for Elijah to do what he did? He's not a, not a Levite, not a Aaronite priest, mm-hmm. and he's sacrificing at a place other than Jerusalem. And so why was this okay? Especially, and more importantly, why was this how did this come to be integrated into a broader Deuteronomistic history that mm-hmm. um, sees centralization and the role of the Levites as, as critical? And one of the reasons why that passage, 1 Kings 17 to 19, is often, more recently, scholars who do work on this have seen it as post-Deuteronomistic, incorporated after Deuteronomistic uh, redaction, is because of this, this view that it seems to uh, evince or um, re- reflect that if we have a confrontation between Elijah and Baal and a strict, sort of a strict monotheism, that this must be Babylonian period or later because of our understanding right, of the development of religion. Because right, of the, uh, yeah, the evolutionary assumption there. Right, yeah. right. So, but my question is, I mean, I don't, I think it's situation is more complicated clearly than that. And I'm, whoever put the final touches on this, I'm interested in what, what they were thought they were doing. But do you think that the way that first Kings 17 to 19 in particular is written that either the original author of that unit or the redactor who put it all together or both or either one, did they think that Baal was a real being and simply not to be worshiped by 
the people of Israel, that the people of Israel should only worship Yahweh? Or is it that, that they believe that Baal is non-existent along the lines of these idol polemics that we get in Isaiah yeah, I, 44? And, I, again, I, I think just as, again, to use an analogy, we'll start this way. Just as in Second Temple Judaism, there's no such thing as Second Temple Judaism, mm-hmm. you know, singular. You're going to have a spectrum of opinion. I think the same would have been true in ancient Israel. So if we had 10 ancient Israelites here, you might get a, a variance you know, in their answers to that question. Mm-hmm. I think, though, that, again, based on, you know, we'll, we'll just say, again, to use another analogy, certainly in, I'll, I'll, I'll go down two lines here, certainly in, in older material, uh, you're going to have, you know, I believe, an acceptance in the reality of, of other gods. These are spirit beings. That, in other words, the belief in an animate spiritual world uh, is going to be something that, far from being unique to Israel or aberrant, it's like, well, everybody more or less thinks this right. way. So that that's one, you know, sort of aspect to this. And so if if that's the case, you know, you're going to have some sense or some belief that, Yahweh really does have spiritual opposition. In other mm-hmm. words, they don't all, whoever they are, they don't all get along. Mm-hmm. And there are rivals and things like this. And so I, I don't see it very coherent to divorce what seems to be a really normal belief system. Again, belief in an animate supernatural world. I don't see why it would be coherent to divorce that from lots of Israelites, including the biblical writers. Mm-hmm. And the other problem or the other issue, I think, is, you know, you, you don't have in later literature, you don't have a denial that there there's divine plurality. Hmm. I mean, you, you get lots right. of references to divine plurality at Qumran. Um, there's over 160 references to plural Elim and Elohim, hmm. you know, a dozen or so specifically in divine council contexts. Now, they aren't rivals, but it's still divine plurality. Hmm. So there, there's a bit of a difference, but again, given you have the before and you have the after, why would we divorce that line of thinking from what's in the middle? Right. Um, so I don't, I, I would answer the question like, yeah, you know, they they really did believe uh, that Baal was some kind of entity. I mean, Baal is just a generic term, Lord or Master, right. and it has geographical attachments and geographical variation, the Lord of Master of any given piece of turf, mm-hmm. you know, that sort of thing. So I, I would answer the, the question affirmatively that, yeah, they, they do believe this. And because they believe it, they, they view it as a, not just a, a violation of practice. In other words, taking away something from Yahweh, but it's throwing allegiance to something else. Right. So I, I would tend to look at the issue that way. The sacrificial thing is really interesting because hmm. you do have a character like Solomon, again, who would be you know, firmly entrenched in, in the, the issue as you described it, you know, with uh, the way Israelite history is talked about. And, and he does priestly things. So does David, you know, yeah. like Gibeah. And, so does Saul. So does Saul. Um, again, with, with varying degrees of, of response, you know, from the prophetic community. So, you know, what would the role of the prophet be? I mean, I, a, a lot of this gets into speculation. Yeah. You know, were the kings just so awful that Elijah was viewed as the only one here representing Yahweh or, you know, I mean, who knows, Hmm. you know, what, if if we can even go down a line like that, you know, what, what have you come across when it comes to, is there another like template for this? Well, we wouldn't really throw him into Melchizedek. (laughs) No, 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 (laughs) no. What I think is going on here is I think that, I mean, it's my hunch at this point. I have not, I, I, I think that you see a lot of kind of variation in the way that these Northern and Benjaminite traditions are kind of incorporated into the Deuteronomistic framework, mm-hmm. um, especially before the temp- the tabernacle is consolidated into the temple. Okay. Um, and I, I have a piece that just came out earlier this year in, in Vetus Testamentum, where I argue that the chronicler and the Deuteronomist have sort of a bit of a difference of opinion on on how centralization works, but they both agree that by the time you get to the temple, mm-hmm. that their centralization is, mm-hmm. is then firmly. Yeah. The, the, there's no, no question where there's, we're not supposed to divide our time between the tabernacle right. and the new Jerusalem temple. But what I think is going on, I think might be going on in first Kings 
17 to 19 is you could argue that it's an exceptional circumstance. The problem with that is that Elijah makes it sound like it's not supposed to be exceptional. Like he says that you've torn down, they've torn down, he complains, he laments to Yahweh, they've torn down your altars. It's like, yeah. well, from a Deuteronomistic perspective, that's a good thing, mm-hmm. right? Um, and they've also, so it, the, the one-off sort of explanation doesn't, it, there's a little bit, it makes it a little bit uncomfortable for that. There's the the Baal's home turf explanation mm-hmm. that says, well, if, you know, it would be, this is just a one-off confrontation on Baal's home turf, but then you have this issue of the continuity with the previous altar. So what I think is going on, I, my hunch is at this point, is that the we have to think of the authors that incorporate these stories into their, they're not strict, they're not strict automatons or they're not strictly conforming every bit of uh, material right. that they incorporate into yeah. their story to their unique theology. They let, in a sense, they let the texts that they're using speak for themselves and they're balancing community memory. They couldn't just make stuff up or change things. Sure. And they're trying to balance um, incorporating Northern and Southern perspectives and Benjaminite right. perspectives in their text. And I think, but I think what, what sets the story and makes it okay is that the stones are consumed. And so for whatever, whenever this is being read in its final final reckoning, you can read this wherever you are and say, this is important for us to know that Yahweh is, is God everywhere mm-hmm. and is sovereign over everything. And he does, he can choose to do whatever he wants with whomever he wants. Mm-hmm. But this is not something that you should then emulate. We shouldn't go then build an altar on Mount Carmel. Mm-hmm. We should still worship in, yeah, it, in it, Jerusalem. Again, he- hearing you say that, Again, this is this is all speculation, but you could yeah. see where, you know, if if you're back in the day, you you could really see an attitude, something like, well, look, we got these high places here, and it's a shame that if we have to have them, or if, if they're here, it's a shame that Baal gets worshipped and Yahweh doesn't. Mm-hmm. So it may not be optimal uh, if Yahweh gets worshipped at one of these places, but it's sure better than than Baal, mm-hmm. you know, that kind of thing. You. You could almost see this sort of pragmatic polemic kind of thing, you know, operating in their heads. But again, right. that, that's speculative. But if, Although, if I were back there and, and somebody and I asked the question, "Hey, why are we doing this?" and, and that was the answer, it's like, oh, okay, that kind of I get it. You know, I may not like it entirely, but I get it at least. Right. Well, what's interesting though is that by the time you get to, you, you do see this when you have the moral assessments of Kings in the book of Kings, Mm -hmm. they'll say like, he walked in the ways of David, his father, uh, or he, he, you know, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but not as his father, David has had done Mm -hmm. because the people still sacrificed at the high places and things like that. Mm -hmm. And the best Kings are the ones that tore down the high places like Josiah and Hezekiah. But then by the time you get to Chronicles, you really don't see much of a mixed assessment of, of Kings. If they don't tear down the high places, Mm-hmm. Then they're yeah. looked upon negatively, or yeah, and you know, and again, you could see that in the wake of what had preceded, you know, the right sort of the the extra awfulness, you know, of exile and and all that, right? Yeah, and it, that's a very human, it's a very human thing. You know, sometimes I think, you know, we um, God certainly uses imperfect beings in lots of contexts, mm-hmm. and you know, they they do the right thing in this or that set of circumstances and God uses them, even though they're, they're maybe not terribly consistent, but they, they're still servants, you know, and and we tend to have this all or nothing kind of perspective because of, you know, some of the things you do read in, in the the historical books there, but that's a really interesting topic. And when you get to, I think the whole story of Northern Israel in first Kings 12 to second Kings 17 is precisely that showing how God does remarkable things, even with people who are not wholly yeah. devoted to him, that Yahweh's relationship, he still has a relationship with Northern Israel. He still, his reputation is still tied right. to them and he's going to go, yeah. go to war with them, go to bat for them. He's going to punish them too. Right. And but if, it's if, an imperfect, it's imperfect, but God yeah. still works with imperfect. And if judges, again, judges being part of the whole complex, yeah. I mean, that certainly happens there. So it's not like if it happens in these other books that it's some sort of aberrant 
Yeah. Like what's that doing there? Well, oh, again, absolutely. If it's part of the same corpus. You know, you can certainly look at, at examples of doing just that, yep. you know, where God is willing to do that. Yeah. Even though you're a mess, you know, you can even say that of David, even though you're a mess. You right. <laughs> right. You know, we're, you're, you're the right person at this, this point in time and let's do that. Yeah. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. That, that whole interplay between the is Israel, Judah, and then Benjamin in the middle. That's where I've really mm-hmm. camped out in uh, the last few years. And, and just that, see those, the relationship between a lot of times we just don't really fully under, fully appreciate the dynamics in the text of the relations between mm-hmm. those tribes. Let, let, me, let me ask this question mm-hmm. as we wrap up. Mm-hmm. If someone really wanted to get into your, your turf, you know, the, the historical books, the Deuteronomistic history, what's a good uh, way of introducing that discussion, again, to an interested lay person, you know, somebody who's maybe not at Hebrew? Uh, what would you recommend to sort of, hmm. you know, awaken them to, okay, here's this, here's this part of the Hebrew Bible. Um, and here's why it's called the Deuteronomistic history, you know, these, mm-hmm. these, this, this clump of historical books. And here's this unit. Here are the issues to think about when reading in one of these books. Mm. Do you have a good uh, recommendation for you know, somebody to uh, jump in? Goodness. Well, I think just, I would say one general recommendation and then a specific plug I could make would be um, Chronicles seems boring until you understand and read it closely with Samuel and Kings and see how creative and, you know, what exactly, it's the only instance I think that we have in the Old Testament of where we have an actual author of scripture, what he was using as his source for scripture. And so Mm -hmm. to see what the chronicler does opens up a whole new world for understanding understanding what the scriptural authors are doing. And Chronicle Studies has just blossomed in the last 40 or 50 years because of that whole uh, approach, whereas previously everything was about reconstructing the history and Chronicler was thought to be late and unreliable, so nobody really paid attention. But now there's just a lot of very interesting, renewed attention on Chronicles. If you're looking for a very if something more academic, so I, I think any standard... Um, introduction to the narrative books or uh, a good commentary on chronicles will have an introduction to that to those issues have you read like dave howard's you know the old uh i think it was moody uh it was before the the hand what was it called it might have been called introduction to the and then they had they had a pentateuch volume they had a historical books volume bullock did the poetry volume you know there was that I think it was the old Moody series. Yeah. But like Dave Howard, you know, has sort of, camped, of Dave ha- yeah, yeah out, out here, but he did that kind of book. Mm. And then I think it was Baker who did a series of handbooks okay. on the different sections, you know, the Hebrew yeah. Bible. Well, there's um, uh, Patricia Dutcher Walls has written a good introduction to the narrative books. That's more kind of approach, uh, like a narrative approach. Um, there's a lot of really good commentaries on Chronicles that have come out in the last 15 or 20 years from a variety of perspectives, um, Jewish and Christian and, um, you know, more critical perspectives by Sarah Jaffet and, um, uh, Gary Knoppers and, um, mm-hmm. Ralph Klein. Uh, and, um, it, but if I were to recommend something more specific and, you know, a really interesting, creative, unique, uh, take on Chronicles, I uh, have to put in a plug for my doctoral advisor, Louis Yonker. He published a book with Moore Zebeck last year that um, explores the. he's pulling from different, different disciplines, including um, Persian period studies and, you know, working in a kind of a post-colonial context as well in South Africa. And, but he, what he really brings to the text is an understanding of the multi-layered identity that stands behind what the chronicler is doing and who the chronicler is speaking to. And how um, how the chronicler w- chronicler's work would have been received, and how it speaks to a very unique and crucial but very exciting time in the Persian period, or maybe mm-hmm. the early Hellenistic period, but where Israel's or Judah uh, Yehud, the Jewish community, is sort of at a, a crossroads, and they're rethinking many things about their faith. But I would say Louis's book; it's called "Defining All Israel in Chronicles." Oh, I saw that this morning. Yeah. It's uh, Moore Z back in yeah. 2016 in the 
for Shungen zum Alten Testament mm -hmm. series. So if you, that's that's more for the real committed uh, yeah, yeah, reader. That's, that's but it, but it is, I don't think book, you need, yeah. don't think you need much Hebrew or Aramaic to, to get into that and really uh, glean a lot from it. Okay. Well, thanks for spending some time with us. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks yeah. for yeah. inviting me. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad we were able to do this. And again, it just a, an interesting discussion. Uh, again, and it's just especially nice since you, you know, you're used to the, the podcast, you know, the audience a little bit, uh, know the, what we're trying to do here. So thanks again yeah. for spending some of your day with us. No problem. All right. We're back at SBL and we have with us, John Schwant. John is a colleague at Faith Life and he is the force behind mobile ed. Well, hi Mike. It's yeah. great to be here. Yeah. So tell the audience a little bit about yourself first. Uh, you know, your education, your areas of interest and expertise. And then we really need to talk about mobile ed because it's something ideal uh, for, for listeners. Well, fantastic. I am a big fan. I was a big fan of Logos from the beginning. My uh, my first degree was in landscape architecture, actually. <laughs> you can see, actually see there's a... I did not know that. <laughs> uh, it, you know, it's, there's actually a connection there. We all go back to the garden, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So when I was uh, finishing that degree, I also loved the Bible, and I ended up buying Logos in 92, so the first version of mm -hmm. it, and uh, I've loved it ever since, and then eventually um, have come to, to work here. So And now, not only has the library grown, but we're inviting in the premium professors from around the world, and you don't have to now pick and choose what seminary you want to go to to get a particular professor. Sure. We're bringing them here and then we connect them to the fantastic library. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember again, I, I was, of course, the listeners are going to know I was at the uh, sort of at the beginning stages of mobile ed. And again, the kind of people in this audience were the people we had in mind. Again, just forget about the expense, forget about uprooting your family, forget about quitting your church to learn how to do ministry. Uh, if you want an education, um, you know, can we create courseware, uh, really course content, again, for someone to learn anywhere, no matter where they are? Again, there's a reason it's called mobile ed uh, on any device. And so, yeah, this is we're now at a place where how many courses are actually shipping now? It's a lot. Yeah, it's over 200 now. Yeah, 200 courses. And again, we invite scholars in specifically with the intent that we want you uh, to give you know, us. And so give our audience, give, you know, those who jump into mobile ed, what you do in your classroom. You know, it's not, it's not watered down. It's not different. It's not, you know, something like that's remedial. This is what they do uh, in the places where they teach. Uh, it's condensed, of course, but you know, there it is. I mean, this, this is what they're going to, they just, they bring their own notes. They bring the notes they use and then they give us the content. Well, that's exactly right. And that's where it gets kind of fun because education's starting to change. And I think it's going to really help the adult learner. And the person you're talking about is, is me. You know, I wasn't in theology to begin with. Later mm -hmm. I went to seminary and, and I had to choose that seminary of the faculty I wanted to learn from. Uh, and then became a great professor for 20 years and then finished my doctorate while I was doing that. But as we bring these professors in and we, they have their class notes, we don't let them lecture for two hours. And that's what I like to do mm -hmm. as a lecture. I, you're lucky I'm not just dominating this, this conversation <laughs> right now. Why don't you get me started? <laughs> we make them stop every 10 to 15 minutes and really think about what they're going to teach. And so it, when you say condensed, yeah, we distill yep. their course into its essential elements. They don't have to keep repeating themselves because we record, we record them and they can replay. So an adult learner mm -hmm. can sit down for five to 10 minutes and learn the key components of any particular lecture that would have been an hour long because of the repetition. Mm -hmm. And then you can see the, uh, you can stop at any point, see the transcript, make notes in it, comment with your friends. It's connected to lots of books that you wouldn't normally get to because of the, uh, the trek across the campus to the yeah. library. Uh, and so we can do so much more in such a small space of time that it's perfect for the, the modern adult learner. Yeah, I remember in the early days, we'd, we'd get people in, you know, scholars from all over the place in the building, and, and they're like, I don't know if I can get through my material in a week. And, and it's like, just look, just trust us, because we know that when you're in the studio, 
you don't have to, uh, there's a lot of repetition. There's a lot of waste of time. You're not going to be talking about, Hey, did everybody get this handout? Uh, for those of you who missed the assignment, here's what it was. For those of you who weren't here last time, well, let's re you know, recap what we did the previous class period. Hey, how about the Cowboys? You know, you don't have these, these rabbit trails uh, and discussions and, and they were amazed I, again in the early days, they were amazed that they could actually get through a semester long course in a week, you know, and, and then chop it up into these, these increments that we, yep. again, that, that's the, the, the thing we imposed on them, you know, breaks, you know, in between, you know, the, their course content again, to chop it up into easily again, you know, you play back, you know, little pieces of it. And if they ever make a mistake, then it's not, Oh, I don't have to repeat the last 30 minutes. You know, I just, it's two or three minutes. It's four or five minutes. So they were just kind of stunned uh, that they could actually get through the content. And it, it kind of made them wonder, like, what am I doing? <laughs> you know, in the regular classroom, why does it take, you know, 45 hours during a semester to, you know, to go through this stuff when I could do it really in 10 hours total? It, it is incredible. I found this to be true, too, at other uh, colleges, universities, and seminaries who are recording some of their content, but they don't usually connect it with the, the books that we have. Yeah. They, so Biola's one, for example, they will, it's very common for them to end up distilling a, an entire semester down into six video hours when mm -hmm. they do this. Now, the, the difference would be the the platform. So when you take a course in, in our platform, it's going to yeah. be connected to a variety of books and then price point is going to be a huge And difference. you can search the videos too, because you have things, you know, transcribed. I mean, there are courses that have transcripts. You can, you know, go in and out again, interact with, with, like you said, the sources, the library. Um, there is a lot of difference and this is not, we should add somebody, you know, a camera in the back of the room and then you got this, you got the guy in the front, and he's kind of tiny, but you can hear him. <laughs> it's it's no, not that. That's right. It's, it's designed for the online learner or mm -hmm. the digital learner. The, that, that person's in the front space. You're in a conversation with the with the guide. And and I I did mention price really as a reference point, but because I do think that we need to think about this as as a society of what we're charging one another to grow in in our understanding of the Bible, mm -hmm. and you know. It, the way we've built the university system, you know, it's very common to pay over fifteen hundred dollars for a course, a semester course, and yeah, I, a single I, course. It's that's a lot of money when yeah. you start to want to learn a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, and so we're since we don't have the overhead of a traditional school, we can focus on the content. We're able to deliver this a, a fraction of that price mm -hmm. point um mm -hmm. and it's there's some amazing deals right now the uh yeah we, we should uh, talk about uh, some sure. of that you know both to churches and individuals so go ahead well in fact there's a, a free course that's available this month the, the logos has the free book of the month this month the free book is a course so you can go to logos.com and pick up an entirely free course and there's another one for for ten dollars um and then there's going to be some uh fantastic uh black friday deals coming up and that for the entire month, mobile ed is the spotlight uh, for the company. And so there is a, you're welcome to call sales. And there's a number of bundles at a tremendous discount off our already crazy good price for what you're getting uh, compared to most institutions. Mm -hmm. All right, now, it, mobile ed, correct me if I'm wrong here, because I'm, I'm a bit out of the sales loop, but mobile ed is accessible through um, subscription, correct? Yep. Okay, so let's describe that a little bit. Well, uh, subscription is a new ground for us, and we're continuing to improve in that. So uh, currently, there's uh, it's fifty dollars a month uh, for access to around thirty courses, mm -hmm. and that that cor that content changes every quarter, and so you can get quite a wide swath of education through that program. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I, you're not going to touch that anywhere. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, you know, trust me. <laughs> yeah. So you got you have exposure to about thirty courses. You said is there is there a tiered thing or is there are there other subscription plans like Logos Now? I mean, what's the relationship between Logos Now and Mobile Ed? So so Logos Now is a membership program, and by being a member of Logos Now, you get access to a, a Mobile Ed course. Uh, there's lots of ways that you're going to be able to find a mobile ed course. So if you 
purchase a base package. They come with a mobile ed course, mm -hmm. at least one. Some of the levels come with multiple ones. Uh, and then we have the free book of the month course right now. Now the now plan has a, has a course. Uh, and I, the subscription model is going to become, uh, we're going to add some new dimensions to it uh, in the coming year. So mm -hmm. just kind of look ahead for that, but the value is going to still be that same great value. And uh, so there's no, I wouldn't wait. Uh, we're going to just kind of add more value to the sure. current program. Yeah. What are, what are some of the, the more popular courses or the ones that come to your mind? Like if, if you want to know about X, Y, Z topic, Hey, we have this great course on, you know, this and that. Well, uh, you might be surprised to hear that uh, probably our, our top selling courses are done by this, uh, this professor called Dr. Heiser. <laughs> 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 well, okay, I'll take credit for the, the shameless plug there. <laughs> he will, I mean, this guy has pr produced these courses on uh, difficult passages, mm -hmm. uh, and those are very important. I mean, that's what we want. Where we want to grow is we want to have answers to problem passages. The the pr stuff that's obvious. Well. You know, I'm, I don't need a teacher for that. I don't yeah. want the extra instructions. So those are have done very well and are very popular. We have some other uh, fantastic uh, professors as well. You know, I would imagine Daryl Bach's courses sell pretty well. Yes, yes. Uh, we got Craig Evans, uh, uh, John Walton. Yep. Um, you know, Mark Furtado. Uh, again, this isn't. You know, th these are these are experienced professors, and they've taught what we're asking them to teach many times. So they're, this is their wheelhouse. And again, you, you get that in an, an easily deliverable form. Again, just think about, again, if you take notes, if you are a Logos user, if you take notes on a course, let's just say you're doing a mobile ed course and you have your own set of notes, uh, notes those, are, those are permanently part of your library. You can actually go search them uh, just like you would search a book. Uh, it, there's just a lot of things that, you know, that sort of changes the dynamic it's not just sort of a static experience where you listen to a lecture and then you leave the room and you've got a set of paper notes or, or even, you know, something in a Word doc. You, you have something that if you're doing it in the ecosystem, it becomes part of that ecosystem just by default. And if you miss something, you can play it over. Again, you could do it on your laptop. You could do it on your phone. I mean, it, 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 this is what it's designed for because, you know, let's face it, you know, real life is – you know, complicated. You there are lots of things that draw on your time, lots of things that get in the way. Nobody has really a sort of an easy, smooth schedule. Uh, you have to break things up, and again, that's the logic behind what we're trying to do. Yeah, and actually, that made me uh, think of something too that we haven't mentioned in terms of the subscription plans. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been talking about the serious student that sure. uh, that uh, doesn't have to be at a seminary, but if they are, that's great too. Uh, what about education for the adult the adults in a church right, right. somebody who just it, like like the curious the curious person you mm -hmm. know i i just want to try something out for a couple hours or you know that sort of thing yeah we have an amazing program it's we call it the church deal right? because it's such a that would a make great, sense <laughs> <laughs> and what it is is it's access to the entire video content of the entire mobile ed catalog, the yeah. 200 courses for an entire congregation. So every member of the congregation yeah. can watch it. Now the leaders are probably going to want to own a course or have the access to the note taking and even take community notes with the, the leadership team probably. But this is a, a program that on faith life TV unlocks all of the video content. And actually at my church, we have a number of small groups using uh, this program to a, as the teaching content. Mm -hmm. uh, well, yeah. I, I should mention uh, the, the the person who does the transcripts for the podcast. Her name is Brenda. I've mentioned her before. Uh, she told me last week that her church subscribes to this, so she gets access to the whole mobile ed catalog for again this the the annual price you know dispensed to a church. You know, everyone in, in her church has access to all of the courses and she's one, I don't, I mean, who, who knows how many people take advantage of that, but, but she really does. She's been through a number of oh, them yeah. already. So, yeah. I mean, if, if your church, if you're a pastor, you know, listening to this, or if, if, even if you're not a pastor, bring it to your pastor's attention that, Hey, you know, you know, we should check this out and our entire congregation 
you know, gets access to every course that mobile ed produces and, you know, go up to the website and, and find out what, what would that be called? How would they find it on the website? Uh, Just church deal. Yeah. So it's, uh, faithlifesites.com slash church deal. Okay. Yeah. I, again, she was real, Brenda was really excited about it. And I know a few other people that, you know, I've met because of the podcast that their church does the same thing. So just think about it. Everybody in your congregation who would care to, you know, put their toe in, you know, even for an hour or so, or, or a hundred hours, you know, there you go. You have access to everything. And I, I end up using the video content more than I want to admit because I have I want to study and I and take notes and do all the reading links, but the day gets away from me and then it becomes night. The, the kids are down, and I turn my Roku on or and I also have Apple TV. I tend to use my Roku more. Mm-hmm. Either one, the Faith Life TV has a channel there, and so I'll pop it on and I'll think, okay, I can watch five minutes of a of a lecture here or there, and sure. and next thing I know, it's thirty minutes later and. I've learned quite a bit, right? It's yeah. kind of relaxed with it. So yeah. that's how I use it. Yeah. Are you, are you saying it, it beats, uh, you know, Dancing with the Stars? Is that what you <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to stuff on your favorite show. But... <laughs> that's not mine. I, I, haven't, I haven't. There are a few things I don't understand. A few mysteries to this in this world. That's probably one for me. That's still. one of them, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for spending a little time with us. Uh, and again, mobile ed is, is a big deal. I mean, it's, it's designed for people who just want to learn something about the Bible and they don't want to have to like change their life, you know, uproot everything, incur a huge expense uh, to be able to do it. So we're glad that John could join us again, introduce people to that program, that effort, really that, that whole concept, uh, that the whole effort on the part of the company to get people content. And if that's what our listeners care about, they, they want content. They're the people who care about learning scripture and are really, they jump in. They are determined, again, to teach themselves. It's why they listen. And Mobile Ed is a great opportunity to do that in another form. Well, thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you. All right, Mike. Well, uh, two great interviews. And uh, I want to give uh, Ben's mom a shout out yeah, for absolutely. introducing Ben to the podcast. So good for you. Good mom. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, really. This, this is what we need. I, I tell people, tell a friend, maybe tell an enemy too. And she's a real, real uh, avid listener of the podcast, and we're we're thankful for that. Absolutely, and Ben feeling isolated where he's at, and says nobody to talk shop to, so <laughs> he can listen to your lovely voice yeah, oh, every yeah. night. And yeah. uh, maybe, feel lucky. maybe we can get Maury on and pinch him, then he yeah. can hear Maury bark. And also, Mike, real quick, uh, you know, talking to John, we we have a coupon code for the Naked Bible listeners. If you go to uh, Faith Life or Log Austin and you, and you check out, use the coupon code Naked Bible Seven. That's the number seven. So Naked Bible number seven. Naked Bible Seven. Use that coupon code when you check out. And uh, I'm not quite sure right now what you're going to get, but <laughs> we'll have more details in the next podcast. You're going to get a discount that. on you're, stuff, but you know we'll. It, it remains to be seen. I don't, yeah, I don't have that in front of me right now, so just go try it and see what happens, huh? Yeah, you All get right. a discount on something good. All right, there you go. Well, we want to thank Ben and John for coming on the podcast, and we want to thank everybody else for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.